happy Reformation Day. And uh, we've talked about the Reformation in the last couple of weeks now, and we're going to kind of wrap up this series on a new Reformation. But it's always good to highlight, as especially as this is Reformation Day, there were people. And yes, Martin Luther is the one um, who kind of like made big waves, but there were people before Luther that were even trying to reform the church. They were trying to be able to say there's something wrong, we've got to talk about it, we've got to talk about it, we've got to talk about it, and then people ignored it. People said, no, we don't want to talk about change because nobody likes change. Nobody wants there to be any change. Let's just keep everything the same. And you see, on Reformation Day is a day that we kind of recognize that there is a moment in time, history, that we look at this Christian Reformation that occurred where we said people took a stand. And there's literally, as Luther um, stood before his, his trial, and he said, here I stand, I can do no other. Here I stand on the word of God. You see, there's other people, they were trying to stand on other things. There was a whole false ground that they were trying to be able to uh, stand on, like good works. And our good works are going to be, you know, enough to carry us. And our good works are going to be things that we're going to take into account. And we're like, but wait a second. God's word says that our, our, even our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. How is it that we could stand on that? And you see, there's the moment that we're saying, hey, like... We've got to be able to take us out of this and to be able to highlight the one, the one who's done it all, the one who lived, died, and rose again, and who gives us grace, and he gives us forgiveness, none of which we deserved, but everything that God has done. You see, in these reformers, just like Luther said, this is what I'm going to stand on. This is not something I'm going to shy away from. This is something that I believe should be declared from the mountains. Why? Because I want everybody to know of this deep grace of God that he has for all people. Yes, Luther was threatened. Yes, many people, when uh, after his trial, thought that the Catholic Church stole him, took him away to be able to burn him at the stake, but they hid him away. He was in a castle, taking all the scriptures, translating them and putting them in the language of the people. And you see, there's the moment that now the... The word of God could not just be given to those who were going to, you know, find their priesthood or whatever it might be. People who were going to, as they believed, take faith seriously by becoming a monk or a priest or a nun. But he said, no, this word of God belongs in the hands of the people. They need to see what God has said, what God has done, and what God will continue to do. And they took a stand. Many reformers came after Luther. Many reformers did the same. They, they stood up and they said, we're not, going to, uh, we're not going to operate this same way anymore. And through generations and generations, the church was continuing to stand. 500 plus years. So 1517 is the year of the Reformation. So if you're looking at it, we are, what, uh, 18, 19, 20, 21, so we're 504 years into the Reformation. And somewhere along the way, people said, oh, like, we're good. The church is good now. Let's just stop reforming. Let's stop changing. Now here's the part when we talk about change and we talk about reformation. I'm not just talking I'm not talking about changing our doctrine. I'm not ch- talking about just making doctrine really easy for everybody so that so that uh, so that nothing is offensive. No, sometimes God's word can be offensive to us. If you haven't been offended by the word of God, chances are you haven't been reading the word of God. And there's a moment that God convicts us 
where we're at and who we are, we are and the sin that we're trying to hold on to in our lives. If we're not changing, we're dying. And this is where we hold tightly to the things of the Reformation. Because are we willing to be able to stand up and say, we are not going to be a people who are just going to just walk along and say, yeah, everything's fine while things are crumbling. We cannot be apathetic. We cannot just be passively accepting of the things that are happening while we do nothing to be able to address it. So how do you gauge success? When you're looking at success in the world today, what does success look like? Success oftentimes looks like someone who has it all. Got money, got power, got friends, got influence. You see, in the world, it's, it's oftentimes what we see on TV. It's the things that we see in movies. It's the things we see in art. And it's reflected back to us the things of success. Because we're going to look at success today. As you can see, it's kind of the title of what we're talking about, looking for success. Because success in our eyes says these are the shiny things that are going to grab our attention, that are going to show us what success looks like, and so that we can too strive after that. Have you noticed that this is exactly what the American dream looks like? The American dream says we're going to climb out of whatever position that we're in so that we can grab some kind of glory that looks like success to the rest of the world. We're trying to grab power. We're trying to grab control. We're trying to grab as many things in life as we possibly can so that we can look successful. In my earlier life, I got out of college and uh, didn't really um, find my fitting in, in in the things that I was doing in my degree, which was criminal justice and psychology. And so what did I do? I just switched. And I said, all right, so what I'm going to do is I had no idea originally, and then it took me a couple of months, and then I went into financial planning. And so there's this thing in financial planning that is you're looking for customers and clients. There's a thing that they always say. They just say, fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. What does that mean? It means fake like you are successful so that everyone believes you're successful. Do do you see that's the image that we try to portray? We're trying to fake like we're successful so that everyone can look at us and say, Ooh, wow, you are successful. I like to be like you. I like to follow you. So you can give me all the tips, all the five easy steps to become successful in this life. And we like to make it easy. But you see, a lot of times, success is a facade. It's the stuff that we put on the outside to gather around us to make it look like everything's successful. You see, we try to be able to build up our fortresses. We try to be able to say, here is the picture of success. Me. I'd like to say that the church has been shielded from this. (laughs) I'd like to be able to tell you here this morning that the church did not go the way of the world And try to be able to then say, hey, this is not what success looks like. But here's the thing. We have a whole bunch of churches that are trying to picture and give everybody a perfect picture of what success in the church looks like. So what does success in the church look like that's different? Tons of people. People want to run up and have everyone... uh, they want to tell everybody how many they, uh, they got saved there that day. They want to say, hey, we, we baptized 100 people today in worship. We want to, we want to you know, be able to put before you all of this. And, and here's, the, 
here's the secrets of it is that it doesn't really matter about the people. It always matters more about the number. There's people who even confessed and through this uh, through these successful church growth movements that they said, oh yeah, like these people weren't even um, ready to be baptized. They weren't even ready to be followers of Jesus, but we needed them for a number to be able to show everybody that we were successful. You see the problem? <laughs> the problem is, is that we're still trying to be able to say, here's our gauge of success. Our gauge of success is always people, and people are bringing money, and money is giving us all of the ability to be able to hire staff and to have a ton of things that are happening, and programs after programs after programs. You see, the gauge of success within the church isn't much different from the gauge outside. This is the reason why today what I talk about is that we need to figure out a new metric. Now, a metric is a standard by which we gauge something. And so instead of being able to take a look at, all right, how many people are sitting in our pews or in our chairs at church today, what's another level of success? What does it look like in Jesus' kingdom? What does success look like there? When you see it, um, look at, uh, you know, I mean, this is just a quick reference. We're not going to look at the scripture, but if you want to later, you can. Take a look at Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15 is all about what God is gauging as success. There's parables. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost sons. Now, in each of those, there is something that was lost that was then found. This is when it says the angels in heaven, God is throwing a party when the lost is found. And not just talking about a hundred, he's talking about one. When we see a metric, and the metrics have to be able to change within the church, why? Because it's so easy to be able to celebrate numbers. Numbers of people, numbers and money, numbers and all kinds of stuff. And yet what we're looking at is God's taking it from this large scale, and he's breaking it down to one. When one comes to the knowledge of salvation, when one was lost that is now found, when one was blind and now they see, that's where success lies. And so we can celebrate this morning. We can celebrate this morning. Why? Because we still say, you know what? Like, I don't know about somebody else who was lost, but I know that I was lost. I know that I was lost and then God found me. And you see the good news about that is then we say, you know what, it, does, it, it means that because I have been found, it means that I have been given sight. It means that there is things that God has me to do today. It means that there are more people that I can find to be able to interact with, to build relationships with. But you see, this takes change. It takes a shift in our ideas. It takes a shift in our focus. It takes a shift in our own lives. Because it means we can't stay where we are. And it means there may be things that we focused on before in life that we've got to be able to change that perspective today. All right, so let's go to our scripture. If you got your Bibles, you're welcome to open it up. We're going to be in Jeremiah first. The prophet Jeremiah has uh, many things to say. This is uh, one of my, my uh, favorite verses that, um, in particular, when we're talking about ministry within the city. 
And you can t- talk about this in ministry to the neighborhood, sure. You can talk about ministry to uh, your own family, sure. But here's the thing. I mean, God is looking at a different perspective. These people in Jeremiah, they have been exiled to a foreign land. They've been exiled. That means that they no longer live in their home country. They no longer live in the place that was comfortable and what they knew and what they did. They've been exiled, kicked out, removed, and now they're living in a foreign territory. And this is what God says to these exiles. Verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters into marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. Because if it prospers you too will prosper. So here's the theology behind this. There were some false prophets at the time, people living in exile, who were giving a false message. They were telling these same people, these exiles who were in this foreign territory in Babylon, they were saying to them, these false prophets, didn't get a word from God, but believed that this is what God would want them to say, and this is where you get false prophets from. Is that these false prophets came to them and said, hey, separate yourselves from these people. They're wicked. They are a terrible people. They are people who have only here to be able to put you down. These are people that you've got to look out for because these people do not have your best interest at heart. And so because of that, stay away from them. Don't do anything with them. Completely separate yourselves. So you see how this is a different message than what God is saying, right? And you see, that's the part, kind of part of the problem here. And we're looking at the scriptures and we're saying, God's saying, make sure that you are in the mix of your new territory. Yes, this is not your home. Yes, this is not the place where you are going to stay the rest of your life. But this is what I need you to do. Be there. Be in the mix of your city, the place where I have you living. Be there. Live there. Don't avoid these people. Know them. See, over lots of generations as well as we've seen the church, the church in the West, The church in the United States, you also hear prophets who preach to you constantly about how this culture is wicked. There is nothing in the mix of this culture that you should be involved with. There is nothing around you. All of it is a whole bunch of people getting ready for hell. You see, there's a look and there's what I believe also in the mix is we have a whole bunch of false prophets today who are saying the same thing, but it's a different generation. They're saying, look at these people. They're all wicked. They're all terrible. Anything in culture is just bad for you. Everything that you have around you is just terrible, and it's going to lead you only to the gates of hell. So don't get involved. And you see, that's a false story. It's a false story to be able to say that everything in our culture is evil and wicked. Because here is the, the part of it that's, you know, it also brings us some, some good news. Is that we are all products of our culture. Every single one of us is a product of our culture. 
the things that we believe, think, understand, it's all from our culture. So what cultures are we a part of? Who influences us? Now, we know that it doesn't just come from one source. It doesn't just say, oh, well, uh, you know, just uh, one person. Like, you know, my parents, you know, they, they taught me this or they, they gave me this, and now this is what I do. It's, this is who I am. No, we get all kinds of stuff. We are influenced by the outside. Now, some of it is not so good. I'm not saying everything that we see around us is good, but there's things about it. We're going to say, what influences me? How do I get balanced out? And there's things that we have to be deliberate about with our lives. We've got to say, you know what? I'm not going to live just some disassociated life not connected to the people around me. We have to be able to say, where is it, God, that you are putting me? Just as we talked about last week, we said, here's a moment that God puts us in the mix of our lives, and God says, now where have you dropped me? What can I learn? And this is good parts. We have to decide to be a part of the solution and not just continue with the problem. What does that mean? It means that there's a whole bunch of people who are running around who are trying to be able to create chaos and disorder. Now, what is it that God's people do in the midst of disorder and chaos? It would be easy for us to just join in the chaos. But we as a people, as God is a God of order, God is not a God of chaos. God is not a God of disorder. God is a God of order. He says, here, this is what I need you to do. I need you to bring peace where there is brokenness. I need you to be able to speak peace into places that are absent of it. You see, this is a shift and a change for us, and it's not easy It's not easy to start going a different direction. But this is part of the Reformation. It's part of the change. We start heading in a different direction. But here's the other part. We have to let God direct the path. Instead of just trying to forge our own way. You see, we are a people. I mean, even, even uh, I would say it, it just doesn't matter what kind of like personality type you are, but each of us tries to forge our own way. We're like, this is what I need to do. This is what I'm going to do. And yet then when God tries to change our path and God tries to change our direction, we're like, God, I'm not going to go your direction. I'm going to go my own because I've already figured it out. I've got my own way. And God says, your, your way is going to be painful. Your way is going to bring a lot of trouble. And we don't believe it. And yet here's a moment we need to be able to look at and say, God, where do you want me to go? So what do we have to do today? Seize the day. You've all heard of that, right? Seize the day. Seize the day. I love this part in, um, in, in I can't even remember which movie it is right now. I'm not thinking clearly today um, just yet. But what I know is that when we're talking about seize the day, when we're saying this is the day that the Lord has made, we will rejoice and will be happy in it, glad in it that this is a new day. And so if we have a new day, if we, that means we have a new opportunity. And we have more opportunities to be able to say, God, where is it that you want me to work today? What is it that you want me to do with my day? Because what happens is if we start living life and we start going our own direction and then we look back and said, oh, I wish I would have listened to God at that moment. And then we always play the what if. Man, what if I would have gone back and I would have listened back there? Or we play this game of the if-onlys. 
You know that game. If only I would have stayed in school and finished my degree. If only I would have fought harder for that relationship. If only I would have looked at that job. What's the if onlys in your life? What's the what ifs? You see, we can spend a whole bunch of time looking at all the stuff in the past on what we could have done or what we should have done or what we could have done or had done or like all that stuff. We we can just spend all our days living in the past trying to be able to make up for that. Or we can say, you know what, God help me to seize this day. This is the day. And this is the day that God has made. So we're going to look at this passage real quick. If you got your Bibles, you can. Um, continue or I'm just gonna there's a couple of passages up front here we're gonna flip back and forth but Ephesians chapter 5 and this is what Paul writes in verse 15 and 16 be careful then how you live don't live like fools but like those who are wise make the most of every opportunity in these days Right? Paul's saying to them, seize the day. When you're trying to be able to make decisions, you're going to say there are people who are going to be foolish, who are going to want to lead you down a path of fools. Now you have to be able to say, how can I discern what path is foolish and what path is wise? Here's always a good thing. What does God say? Now, that's an easy one to be able to say, like, what does God say? Like, I want to be on God's path. And you're like, but, like, the scriptures aren't a magic eight ball. You don't just shake, it, shake the Bible and then somehow open it up and it says, oh, God wants me to do this today. No, that's not the way that scripture works. So what do you need then? You need a wise and discerning heart. A heart that is already following God. And then what you do is you say, hey, I need my community. I need the people of God that surrounds me to be able to speak into this. Because I'm having a hard time. I can't figure out what it is that I should do. I know that this is what's been presented to me. But I don't want to follow in the path of fools. I want to follow in the path of the wisdom of the wise. So you ask the people of God, you ask people who are surrounded, have surrounded you, hopefully, and this is another shout out here, like we need people around us. Do not isolate yourself. Isolation never does anything good for you. Because what isolation does is it leads you to your own thoughts. And guess what? Our thoughts are not always good. Our hearts are not always leading us in the good direction. And so when people are saying, what does your heart say? Follow your heart. You're like, oh, but wait, hold on. Our heart and our flesh are going to sometimes follow what our heart and flesh want. And that's not the things of God. We have to be able to say there's got to be more to it. And so we need to be able to say, God, help me to be able to seek things out that are good. Seize the day. What else does this passage say in Jeremiah? It says, seek shalom. Right, shalom. Everybody knows shalom? Shalom is peace. Now, what we talk about sometimes is is, uh, shalom is is presented to people as kind of just this, uh, we uh, we want peace and not war. And that's kind of the way that it's presented, like we want peace now. Like this peace has somehow been presented to us that it's, that it's just outside conflict. That we have conflict within a people that are outside of us, and we need to figure out how to stop the conflict. Peace is part of that, yes. But there's also shalom means a whole bunch of different stuff. It's wholeness. It's wholeness in us, and it's wholeness outside of us. 
So when we are seeking shalom, when we are seeking peace, if you are not at peace with God right now, that means your insides, there's going to be turmoil. You're always going to be wondering. You're always going to be asking those questions with God, like, I wonder if God loves me. I wonder if God is for me. I wonder if God is, you know, is going to forgive me. I wonder if God is going to do what I can't do for myself. I wonder if God, right? You're going to always wonder if you're not at peace with God, there's going to be that conflict inside of you constantly. That's why peace with God, with you and God, is going to be important. Come to that place to know, to be able to celebrate. You know what? Like, doesn't matter in this life what happens. I know that God's got me. I know that I make mistakes. God forgives me. I know that God has put me in front of people. Love them. You see, there's the moments that we are saying, God, I'm at peace with you. Now help me to be able to look at what it means to be at peace with others. And this is the part that seeking shalom, some people stop at themselves. They say, oh, I already know Christ. I already know, you know, salvation. I already know all of that. And so peace is good with me. And they think it's just for themselves or their already clan. They're already group. But you see, this passage speaks to more. It says, we are not supposed to just seek the the prosperity, the welfare, the peace of ourselves. But it says the city around us. Because that's where we'll be able to gauge success. That's where we gauge success is when our city, when our surroundings, when there is peace, then we know that we're like, yes, that's a measure of success right there. It's the reason why we constantly pray for our city. It's why we constantly pray for our nation. Because we know right now there's lots of turmoil. Lots of conflict. And we're saying, God, help me to figure out what it means to be able to speak peace into all of this division. So there's two kinds of, uh, of, of peace when we look at it. Well, not two kinds. But we see shalom. And shalom uh, peace is where we would say, where is God working? And that means you're looking at yourself, but you're also looking around you. Where is God working? That means all the positive ways, all the things that God's doing to help you grow and the people around you grow. But we also start to be able to see broken shalom. And broken shalom gets highlighted quite a bit. Because where has peace been shattered in our world? Everywhere. There's brokenness, broken peace, all throughout our world. And in the absence of shalom, there's an abundance of tears, mourning, pain, and death. This is not fun. This is the human experience. This is where we live. And what are we going to do about it? Are we just going to say, well, of course there's going to be death. Of course there's going to be mourning. Of course there's going to be pain. Of course there's going to be tears. And we're just going to say, yeah, whatever. Or we can say, where is it, God, that you can help me to work in the midst of it? So last week I uh, had you pass out um, the Circle of Awareness. Laura, can you grab those papers on the corner? Um, If you didn't get a Circle of Awareness, uh, while she's passing that around, um, I just want you, just going to give you a quick breakdown of it. So what you'll find is the circles. Um, I'll just go to this real quick because this is it. This is what it looks like right here on the screen is you get these Circles of Awareness. 
This says we need to start being aware of who God is putting in our life. And we're not looking at large numbers. I put four spaces down here. And I want you to be able to, and I, and I talked about spending time with this this past week, but if this is the first time you've seen it, then don't worry about trying to be able to, you know, reverse this. But what we have is there's moments that we need to be aware, who is God putting in our life right now? And there's where we look at my neighborhood, my work, my city, um, my friends, and I would say slash family. And this is the moment that we look at these circles, and then the circle in the middle is what I would call our third place. Um, it would be places that we frequent. Somewhere, if you say, I go grocery shopping at the same place at the same time every week, then that would be a place that you could put down some people that God has put you in the mix of. If it's the coffee shop in the morning, there it is right there. Another place that you frequent. It's another place that you're going to find people that God puts in your life. And instead of just being able to ignore it, we're going to say, God, help me to be able to see the people that you've put in my life. Now, that's kind of the breakdown that we talked about last week. So, when we're looking at this circles of awareness sheet, when we see shalom and broken shalom, now we're going to be able to expand this. So, where in those people that you've seen in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your city, in your family and friends, where do you see God at work in their life in a positive way? The positive things, the shalom, the peace, the wholeness. Where do you see God at work there that's positive things are going well and you see God at work in their life? Now that's the positive stuff and those are always good moments to be able to celebrate with people and yes, in prayers to God, all of the positive stuff. But we're also going to look at expanding this and saying, God, where is it that you are, where am I seeing brokenness in the people that you have put in my life? Where are they experiencing pain, hurt? Is there somebody who's going through a divorce and you're saying, I need to be able to be present with them? Is there somebody who's going through heartache and illness? Then you have the moments that you're going to say, God, you are allowing me an inside door, an inside path to be able to not just pray for them, but to pray with them. God, I want you to be able to help me to be able to do and speak the words that I don't even know right now. Help. This is a part of the changing metrics because then as we talk with one another, as we talk in small groups, we can say, you know what, uh, you know, the, the friend at work that we're praying for, like there's a breakthrough. Hey, you know what, the, there's the, the city, um, you know, neighborhood alder, alder woman, and, and there's a breakthrough here, and there's a moment that I've talked to them, and I'll be able to share with them, you know, words of hope and words of peace. There's a breakthrough. You see, this is part of the transformation and change that occurs within the church is because we're not just looking at, hey, how many people came to church today? But guess what? How many people got sent today? How many people are went into their daily lives with their eyes open of the people that God is sending to them? Because you have a unique circle that only you have. It's a circle that's going to be different from mine. It's going to be a circle that's different from everyone else in this room. You have a unique place. And this is where we talk about like the plans of God. He says, start being aware. Keep your eyes open. God has uniquely placed you where you're at. With who he's placed you with. Let's read this passage real quick from Acts chapter 17. 
I put this one in here because um, the, the Bible study on, on Tuesday, is, as I've mentioned to you, we uh, were going through um, the book of Acts. And in Acts um, 17, we just read this um, this past week, and I found it um, significant um, because Paul is preaching to a people who don't know God. And this is what he says to them in 26. From one man he created all nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. And here's the key part of this, because he says, God is never far from any of us. Notice that. See it. The people in your circles, God is not far from them either. We're not just talking about the church and the body of Christ. Yes, God is near to the body of Christ. But God is also near to those who are far from him. God is never far from any of us. And you look at the context in which Paul was preaching. These were people that either believed in just hedonism. Everything was good and there's nothing that's bad for you. There's no death. There's no uh, this. There's no that. Everything is good. Everything is beneficial. Don't worry about everything. And then there was people who were just like, well, we got all these foreign gods and they're all good. Let's lift them all up. And so you see Paul's preaching to a people that have all kinds of different theology. And what does he still say? And God is never far from any of you. Because God's always on the move. So how are we looking at success? How are we looking at making a difference in others? It's by showing love Showing the love that God has for us by loving others. Why this takes into consideration the great two commandments, love God and love people. And how are we going to do that? We're going to reflect this love of God. God loves me and now I'm reflecting it to everyone that I meet. And just because this is uh, Reformation Day, we're going to close on Ephesians. Always got to bring Ephesians into this. Ephesians chapter 2. Why? Um, so some of you aren't familiar, but uh, in, the, in the Lutheran tradition, um, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 are often quoted. It's the, for by grace we have been saved through faith. It's a gift of God so that no one can boast. Right, And sometimes we stop at 8 and 9 and we don't see 10. But 10 gives us a really good perception, an understanding that we're not just to stop when God loves us. Let's read verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. He's created us anew in Christ so that we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. God puts people in your life. Let's start being aware. Let's say it's not good enough to be where we're at right now, but to be able to say, God, help me to see change so that I can love others differently, so I can love others wholly, just as God loves us. In Jesus' name.